Good evening. Thank you all uh, for coming uh, for what is our final uh, lecture of the fall semester, Asvad's um, Medze. This is not, however, the, I assure you that the, uh, the program will uh, continue in full force next semester, so I want everybody to keep uh, an eye out for our upcoming events. Some of them may, oh, may have been up on the board earlier, uh, and I'd also like to remind everybody uh, that our annual banquet uh, will take place this year on March 19th, Sunday, at its normal place. Um, and our guest speaker uh, will be Dr. Mary Papazian, who's the new head of San Jose State University, something uh, we're very proud of and uh, we're very honored that she'll be our guest of honor um, at our banquet. So uh, please, uh, details about the banquet will uh, be forthcoming, but if you get your uh, High Sharjum, your copy of High Sharjum, you'll also find information on the banquet there. So we hope to see you all um, on March 19th at the banquet. Tonight is not only our final uh, uh, lecture uh, for the fall semester, but it's also the final uh, Kazan lecture that will be delivered by Dr. Uh, Khachig Muradian, um, who has graced us uh, with uh, two wonderful and uh, exciting lectures previously, one on humanitarian resistance uh, to the genocide and uh, the other on the Armenian community of China um, trying not to fall off the end of the earth. Uh, both of these opening uh, new vistas, um, at, le at least with humanitarian resistance, the, uh, obviously the genocide is, is a more common topic, uh, but he provided a new vista into how we can analyze uh, the, uh, the Armenian um, or agency uh, within, uh, within the genocide. Uh, and likewise, in his second topic, exploring a, a field that many of us knew nothing about, I think, beforehand, and we're looking forward to seeing more uh, from uh, Dr. Muradian on uh, the Armenian community in China. And the other thing that was fascinating was how much that developed from his stay here in Fresno and in talking with uh, the local community. And uh, we've now uh, started working on um, small projects developing the, the photographic history uh, of that community as well. So um, his presence here has been a great boon uh, to our program. This evening, he's going to present a, his third and final lecture, which is on a different topic. Uh, it's titled A Tale of Two Midwives, The Notebooks of Sephora and Nuritza Shnorhokian of Eintab, uh, who lived from 1890 to 1930. These notebooks, um, these notebooks are special in that they provide us uh, with a, a wonderful opportunity to, to get a glimpse of what we sort of say in the field is a micro history uh, of life in Eintab. Um, and the region um, in this 40-year period, rather than focusing on the larger political movements or solely upon the activities of uh, the elites uh, who uh, rule the area, um, sources such as these notebooks provide us a glimpse into lesser studied, lesser known, and yet not less important facets of life and society um, at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century uh, in Eintab, in the collapse of the uh, Ottoman Empire, and in Syria. Um, and so it's with great uh, expectation um, that uh, we listen to tonight's lecture, which is again new research uh, um, on Dr. Muradian's uh, part. Um, and so it will prove to be, uh, I think, a, a, a lecture that will open, uh, not will not just provide answers, but I think will open new questions uh, for us as well. Uh, so I thank you all, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to present uh, Dr. Khachik Muradian. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Uh, I'd like to start, so this is my final talk here, and uh, my final week here. So uh, in fact, I'm moving out of my apartment tomorrow morning. Uh, <coughs> so uh, I think uh, I need to, uh, say a few thanks. Uh, I'd like to start with the community here. Uh, when I first uh, got here, I didn't know what to expect, and that's the, probably that's, a, that's the positive way of saying this. Uh, because, you know, uh, some of my, my friends and colleagues actually, you know, weren't that crazy about Fresno. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I really did not know what to expect. I was, of course, I didn't know about the program. I had been here and I had done research on the China collection, so I didn't know about the program, and that I knew well, and I knew that that was going to be a nice environment for me. But 
Beyond that, I had very little interaction with the community and a very little knowledge of uh, the community here. Uh, but uh, I have to say that uh, my last week here, my last few days here have been bittersweet because of the connections that I have made with uh, many of you here and many others who are not here tonight. And uh, not only that, but it has also enriched my research. Uh, l let me say this in a couple of, uh, from a couple of perspectives. The first is that, uh, in fact, I have made use of material here to in, in my research, and you saw that in the China lecture last time. I have also, uh, you know, taken advantage of the fact that I'm here as a visiting professor to uh, conduct research and continue doing my work. In fact, I submitted uh, a book proposal, which I was, uh, you know, my dissertation turning into a book from here as I was working here, and currently I'm working on finalizing the manuscript. I've also uh, worked on this lecture and the research behind it uh, here as well. Uh, it's, this is the very first time I'm giving this talk, so you're going to be a little patient with me. I'm trying to figure out how to you know, wrap my mind around this phenomenal resource that I have. But beyond that, I also, one of the more enriching experiences here has been my interaction with you guys. Uh, every single talk that I gave here opened an opportunity uh, for some of you who are connected to those uh, lectures and topics in one way or the other to approach me and provide me with additional resources, memoirs, personal accounts, interviews. It's been unbelievable. Let me just give you one example from the China lecture last month. During the lecture, uh, as I was talking about the Armenian community in China, if s some of you who are here would remember, I was reading a portion of a letter by an officer, uh, an, an American uh, soldier serving in uh, in China, in Shanghai, in 1945-46, uh, Sergeant Karenian. So this was a letter that Karenian had sent back home to Connecticut to his family. In the letter, he mentions meeting an Armenian, another Armenian in China, uh, an Ar Ar another Armenian-American soldier in China, uh, Harry Sadoyan. So I was reading, as I was reading this, somebody in the audience in the back there was like, and I was like, like, this is not the time to ask questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm in the middle of reading a letter. And turns out that it was Harry Sadoyan. <laughs> that day was his 90th birthday, 90th birthday, and he told his wife, I want to go and, you know, attend this lecture. And uh, so his wife said, like, why the hell are you going to go and attend a lecture on your 90th birthday? I don't know, but probably his connection with China. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had uh, breakfast with Harry Sadoyan, and he brought with him his log and a couple of pages of notes that he had taken as he was, uh, as he docked in Shanghai. And not only that, but he told me some stories which opened uh, further avenues of research for me as far as the Armenian community of China is concerned. And again, this is just one example. Uh, you will hear today in the talk, in fact, I will be playing a portion of an interview that I conducted with one of the neighbors of one of the midwives who is again here in the audience today. So uh, the reason I say this is because, again, as I said, this has not just been a very uh, rewarding and fulfilling experience for me in terms of teaching here. In fact, some of my students are here. Can I see some hands? Yes, well, one. <laughs> 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 but, there is, but there is an explanation for this. So I teach, on, on Wednesdays, I teach from 4 to 7 p.m. And not only was he sitting at my class today, but he decided to then come and attend my lecture. And believe me, even I cannot listen to myself for five hours. <laughs> so the fact that he braved this, this challenge is, is uh, you know, really deserves a lot of credit. Uh, <coughs> long story short, this has been a very rewarding experience for me. And uh, I will be leaving Fresno, uh, thinking about Fresno very differently than I did when I arrived here. 
And I will be leaving Fresno also uh, uh, realizing even more uh, the, the importance of the institution and the program which has organized this event tonight. Uh, I want to say this, although nobody asked me to plug the program here, but I want to say this because that is what I saw. That is what I saw, that is what I experienced, and, uh, and the ability of the Armenian Studies program here to really reach the community, to really enrich the students, and access both Armenian and non-Armenian students is, is tremendous. And I think uh, that is, again, uh, something that we ought to, uh, to think about. Uh, it, is, it is one of the jewels that, uh, of, of, uh, of Fresno State and, and Fresno. Uh, this city in general. So I think uh, it's important to highlight this. Uh, so uh, concluding my introduction, uh, I, I would like to thank uh, Barlo and Sergio for this opportunity, for having me here. And I have a feeling that I will come up with excuses every now and then to come and lecture here again. Uh, so you will hear me talk about other topics perhaps in the future. So. Without further ado, I'll start with my lecture. So how did this come to be, this, this particular topic? One of the things that uh, we scholars do, especially if we are uh, <coughs> you know, dealing with modern Armenian history, uh, 19th, 20th centuries, is every time you go somewhere and somebody tells you, I have a memoir, I have an account, I have a piece of paper, I have anything, you know, we, uh, we try to make copies and, 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 you know, just set it aside even if we're not working on that particular topic at that point in time. Now, a uh, couple years ago, I was vid visiting a friend. Uh, in fact, I was visiting, visiting their, their house for uh, a meeting and then lunch, and they mentioned in passing that they have two notebooks by Armenian midwives who lived in Eintab. And of course, uh, right on after lunch was over, I started taking pictures on my phone of every single page of those two notebooks. Uh, that was my dessert. At that point, I had no idea what I was going to do with this. I realized the significance of it. I realized that there's... Uh, there's a lot of potential here for, uh, you know, to really look into this, but I didn't really know what I'm going to be doing with it. Last year, 2015 March, for the first time in 100 years, uh, a group of scholars, activists in Aintab, Turkey, decided to organize uh, the centennial of the Armenian Genocide in their city. The Armenian Genocide had never been commemorated in Nantab before. And uh, they invited me to speak there. I had uh, no idea what I was going to do, but I clearly knew that I wasn't going to go and give some kind of, you know, like history of the Armenian Genocide. I realized that often the best way to reach audiences is not by giving going to details about what happened when and what but also but try to connect with them with stories that mean something to them and at that point i realized that the midwives who were from Aintab and practiced in Aintab for years starting in 1890 and in fact a couple of years before that would be a perfect story for me to tell there. So once I decided that that's what I'm going to do, I sent a positive answer response and I showed up in Eintab. Uh, this was again the centennial March 2015 and uh, I prepared a short speech. I put up the picture and a couple of pages from their notebook on the screen behind me and there were a few hundred people in the audience and here's what I told them. I started uh, the story of the two midwives, Nuritsa and Sifora Shunohokian. 
I told them that these midwives uh, helped deliver close to 5,000 children. Uh, just one sister, and the other sister a few thousand herself. So we're talking in between the two thousands of children. Most of them in the city of Ain Tab. And I told them how in 1915, after 1915, particularly after late 1915, when the deportations begin from Ain Tab, August, uh, late July, August, how the number of B children, Armenian children born in the city, significantly was reduced. I told them about the notebooks and how in, every s in these notebooks, each sister had listed every single child that was born with details. I'll show you some of the details. We're talking really details. Like if the buttock comes out first, they mention it. <laughs> if the feet come out first, they mention it. So, and, and I told them that these two midwives served their home city of Aintab without thinking about the ethnic or religious background of the people they were serving. You see there are Armenians, Turks, Kurds, Arabs, Mormons, uh, evangelical Armenians, uh, Catholic Armenians. And they did this year in, year out in a cosmopolitan city where for so many people Sephora, the older sister, was actually the word for midwife. So in fact they didn't use the word midwife. For them, Sephora meant midwife, right? It had become her name had become synonymous with childbirth, delivering children. And then I told them that Again, if you look at the notebook, starting in August 1915, you have fewer and fewer Armenians in the city, fewer and fewer childbirths. On the other hand, the number of non-Armenians they are delivering, non-Armenian babies they are delivering increases, right? And then I told them, you know why. I wasn't talking about the genocide, I didn't use the word genocide for the almost the entire speech. And I said, you know why. And then I said, in 1923, these women were forced, uh, 1922, late 1922, these women were forced to leave Ain Tab. And in their notebook, they explain how they escaped. And they say, our work in Ain Tab is over. Ain Tab te ishimiz bitti. And I told them, you know why. And then these two sisters end up in Aleppo. We're talking 1920s Aleppo. This is the place where the remnants of survivors of the Armenian genocide ending, are ending up from all over the Ottoman Empire. And this is the place where under horrendous conditions, a new generation of Armenians are being born. The generation of Armenians on the shoulders and backs of whom the Armenian diaspora was built. And these two midwives helped deliver these children. If you go again, if you go to, the, to their notebooks, you will see how in Aleppo in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, uh, they're con you know, every single childbirth is from a family from one corner of the Ottoman Empire. All having converged in Aleppo as a consequence of the Armenian genocide. And at the end I told them, when I look at you, this was, as you can imagine, a predominantly Turkish audience, I can't help but wonder that your grandparents or great-grandparents came, were delivered, were born first into the hands of one of these midwives. And I can't help but wonder that, uh, that but think that, you know, 
the first person to carry your grandparents and great-grandparents was one of these midwives. And I said, if you want to honor the, st the history, your own history, your own memory, you honor the history of the and the memory of these women as well. These two women lived in Aintab for decades, wanted to continue their lives in their hometown. But they were forced to leave. And just think about it, only a hundred years later, they were able to come back to their hometown as a picture and a story. But at the same time, the story of these two midwives is a testament and a reminder of uh, the will to survive and thrive in Armenian communities worldwide. My three lectures here were titled Genocide and Resilience. And I picked these three topics with the intention of emphasizing how first in terms of humanitarian resistance, in terms of organizing against genocide, not just by through armed resistance, uh, resistance, but also in any possible way resisting destruction and annihilation. You know, th you know the Armenian com uh, community, particularly in Aleppo, but Armenians during, during the Armenian genocide play a, a tremendous role, organized, not just as individuals, but as groups. My second lecture on China was also similar. It really stressed the agency of Armenians who escaped the genocide, arrived all the way in China, and how these little communities there supported the refugees who were arriving in their town, in their city, and tried to rebuild their lives. And here, too, we have two women who are, uh, whose, whose story, whose uh, history is so intricately connected with the story and the history of the Armenian people. Beginning in Aintab, in the 1890s, and ending up in Aleppo and then Beirut uh, after the 1920s. So what happened then was that first, let me say a few more words about what happened in Aintab. Uh, I still get requests from people in Aintab, Turks and Kurds and others, who send me the names of their grandparents and great-grandparents and ask me to check if they are on the in the notebooks. And I have found several of them uh, who are listed there. Uh, what I have found more are the descendants and are the names of many Armen Armenians from Aintab, uh, whose uh, grandparents, great-grandparents were delivered by these uh, two sisters. So what I'm going to do today is uh, provide an overview of Armenian midwives in general, very quickly, and midwives in the Ottoman Empire, and then talk about the journey of Sephora and Nuritsa Shinorokian through specifically, particularly their, uh, their notebooks. I will be showing some images, and then talk a little bit about, uh, again, the idea of resilience, dispossession, and then uh, rebuilding Armenian communities uh, in Syria, in Aleppo, and beyond. Uh, so let's start with this photograph. This is a photograph of the three sisters, uh, uh, Sephora, Nuritsa, Os Osana, and uh, another relative. This is the one photograph that I have so far, but I think I'm, I believe I'm pretty close to acquiring a few more. Uh, of, of the three sisters. So this is, they were six siblings, three sisters, three brothers, uh, and their extended family uh, is all over, spread all over the world. In fact, one of their brothers had 10 children, so you can imagine, uh, uh, from Australia to North America, particularly uh, California and San Francisco, to Lebanon, to New Jersey, Boston, you name it. Uh, it's been also very rewarding because on a couple of occasions as I was 
in my talks on other topics, I mentioned these midwives and put up the picture, and I had several members of from the family, you know, approach me afterwards and 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 mention and talk about them. So uh, let's start with a few images from the notebooks. So these are a couple of pages that gives you an idea. I'm talking about uh, this is Armenian Turkish, so it's in Armenian letters, but it's Turkish. Uh, and essentially month by month, day by day, starting in 1890, although she, uh, you know, the, the she did deliver children before 1890, one sister is listing every single childbirth until her death. I will show you a page later on where uh, her sister writes, my sister died on such and such day at the end of the notebook. Uh, but so we are talking about an entire history of the Armenian community, Armenian community in Aintab, uh, from the late 1800s all the way up to the 1920s. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit. Let's look at a, f a few of these, and uh, let me explain how it's divided. So at the top of the page, there are statistics, right? Like so, on August. In, in August 1890, I delivered 10 children, five boys, five girls. Then September 1890, seven children, four boys, three girls, etc. right? So at the top, you have those statistics. Then uh, you have it day by day listings, right? It's on every single day or, or you know, on every single week. Uh, you have a description of the family whose child it was right? Uh, the descriptions are also very interesting. So sometimes you have names, sometimes you have the name of the wife, sometimes you have the name of the, of the husband, sometimes you have both. You also have some description. So she says, uh, the Mormon Vartan's son, right? So you have a little bit of description about the family, sometimes, you know, sometimes there are Jewish families, and, and she says, you know, like, Jewish such and such as, you know, son or daughter, right? And then, at the end, uh, she lists whether, again, if it's a boy or a girl. And then at the very end, uh, she lists how much she charged for it or how much she received. So this is also an accounting book, right? Now, one of the things that I have done, uh, again, from here in Fresno, is talk to family members, some of whom are in their 20s, others are in their 80s. I've, I've, in fact, interviewed <laughs> almost like a dozen family members from the Shinorokan family. And one of the interesting things that came across is that many members of the family are very much into keeping detailed records of things. <laughs> so this, this runs in the family. Anyway, uh, but of course, th there's, an account there's, a, there's a few reasons they're doing this. One of them is actually account you know, bookkeeping, right? You know, keeping an account you know, uh, on how much you know they're they're charging for each child. Now, th even that has some interesting features. So, when the baby is stillborn, they don't charge, as you can imagine. When the families are not wealthy, they charge very little. Sometimes they don't charge at all. I'll come to this later on. When the families are rich. It seems like they used to get like a nice gift. So you have like, you can clearly notice that. And if you really compare it to some of the very wealthy families in Aintab, uh, you know, you can see that their children, when their children are born, you can imagine it's a festive opportunity occasion and you know, they can get a nice, nice gift as, as a result. So all of that is listed here. Now, I, I wanna show you just a couple of, uh, you know, focus on, zoom in on, a couple of these listings and say a few words about them, just to give you an idea of flavor of how this whole thing uh, works. So this is, uh, fr you know, a, a listing. The, top, the one at the top is some uh, guy from Ulfa. Uh, at the bottom, though, the second one, it says, Kolanja uh, Harutyun's twin. So it's, it's twins, right? The first, Birinjisi Gutten which means that the buttocks came out first. <laughs> so, 
ikincisi, okay, uh, baştan, which is the head. The second came out the head first. Uh, i̇ki tane el, right, two heads. Uh, so, and then there's the date. Now it gets more interesting. The twins, of course, are fascinating because uh, the level of description she provides is, is just mind-boggling. Here's another example. It says, uh, uh, again, Kuyumju Krikor's uh, twins. The first was born. The other one, 10 hours later, she had pain again. And uh, the other one was born uh, 10 hours later. Okay, so you have many cases like this where there's like a lot of detail. Every single time, if a child bo is born buttocks first or uh, our, our, our feet first, you have that listed. Sh they also provide statistics about child mortality. Now, here's the thing. These are notebooks that list the, you know, the, n the number of the, the children that they deliver. But that's not what they, what they did, did only. Uh, we're talking about two women who had this encyclopedic brain and knew a couple of things. One, which family was due when in the entire city of Eintab? And then which family was due when in their own neighborhood and city in Aleppo later on? Not only that, but one of the things that come, came across very clearly during interviews, they actually did not, obviously, as you can imagine, you know, they took care of the mothers in the entire process of the pregnancy, right? So they, they had these uh, regular visitations, that's one. Second, they often took care of them afterwards as well, and they also served as nurses more often than not, right? So th they, they're playing a key role in, uh, in the, in the social fabric of Eintab in, in this regard as well. Now, uh, let me give you an example to illustrate this. Uh, I have identified close to 30 uh, individuals whose grandparents or great-grandparents were delivered by these midwives. And one of the interesting features that came across is that in one case, we're talking about three brothers, and I could find two of them, but somehow I couldn't find a third one. And I told uh, the great-grandson, I just can't find him. Can you really ask your grandmother and see why is, not, is he not listed? Why uh, are these two women not the midwives for that childbirth, right? Of course, Aintab was a big city, and there were other midwives. I know as a fact that there was, in fact, another Armenian midwife, at least, practicing around the same time. However, I was pretty sure that it's, it's, it's going to be the same midwife who's delivering. And then, here's what happens. Turns out that that third brother was born when the family was on top of a mountain at a picnic. <laughs> so, although the family did receive visitations from the midwives before and after the childbirth, but the, uh, the childbirth itself was done you know, like spontaneously, just with the parents taking, trying to take care of it. Uh, it really shows that, you know, the, the, the degree, the level to which these women were involved in the life of the community. Let me give you some numbers to give you an idea. We're talking about a community that was, before the genocide, probably around 40,000. 40,000 Armenians. Uh, if we look at the number of children that they helped deliver, they delivered in Aintab, Armenian children, it, it's a few thousand. So if you think about it, anywhere between four to five, and if you think about it, uh, that is a good portion, good chunk of the total childbirths, Armenian childbirths in the city of Aintab for that period, right? So essentially these two women almost single-handedly, these two sisters, one who starts practicing in 1890, the other who starts practicing in 1905, right? single-handedly, almost, are responsible for most of the births, Armenian births in Aintab in that entire period. As I said, there were other, at least one Armenian uh, midwife that I know of, uh, but that's the idea. Now, let me connect this to the history of midwifery 
in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, beginning in even, we, we have accounts of uh, different midwives. Nothing to this, in, to, to this level of detail. We have a few cases where we have a few statistics about how many children they delivered. Most of them are midwives who lived, uh, who served either the palaces of s or some dignitaries. In fact, one Ottoman scholar uh, dif distinguishes three categories of midwives. One that served in the royal palace, uh, the type that, you know, the midwives who served in the royal palace. Let me uh, list you the names in, in, in Turkish as well. So let's see. Uh, so you have the Sarai Humayun, and then we have these, these are the, the palace midwives essentially. And then the noblemen's midwives, who are called the Kibar Ebesi. Ebe meaning uh, midwife, Kibar are the uh, you know, dignitaries, noblemen. And then the commoners, right? And the commoners were Ahadinas Ebesi, which is again the common folks' uh, midwife. Now, the least studied of these, as you can imagine, are the commoners' midwives, right? We have, I mean, forget about Armenians. We have no records of these as far as even in the, the entire Ottoman Empire is concerned. Uh, and it's important because in general, you know, history, and as, uh, you know, Sergio mentioned earlier, right, history is not just the stories, the history of kings and queens and what they did, right? Uh, we, we often in, in, you know, in, in, in high school, in, in, in middle school, in kindergarten, you know, like history is often portrayed to us as this king, you know, was victorious, that king was defeated, etc. But ultimately, what is equally compelling, if not more compelling, is a story of one soldier in the army of one of those kings. Because it tells you a different kind of story. It tells you a perspective, like essentially a people's history, say, right, of that period. Now, these two midwives and their accounts, their notebook, really provide insight into the people's history of the Armenian community in Aintab initially, and then as we move on into the life of the Armenian community in Aleppo. So let me continue on with a few other examples of this. Again, this is an example of a childbirth that's from uh, you know, the buttocks first, which again, she mentions good then. Now, I want to show you a couple of other examples. Let me start here. So, uh, in many ways, the history of these two midwives is closely associated with the history of Armenians of Aintab all the way until 19. So, for example, when the 1895 massacres, Hamidian massacres, were taking place, in the period when these massacres were taking place in Aintab, you had the number of childbirths went down. When, the, as I said earlier, the deportations of Armenians of Aintab started in the summer of 1915, the number of Armenians uh, who were being born in the city dropped in their notebooks. Fast forward. At some point in, the 19, in er, 1918, early 1918, right? Ottoman defeat, uh, the Ottomans are not defeated fully yet. You know, the British are not in the region. The French are not in the region. If you read the pages of the notebook, almost every single childbirth is non-Armenian. You have Arabs, Kurds, Jews, you, you, uh, you name it. I have even managed to identify one case in which they are giving birth. They're, uh, they're helping in the delivery of uh, the son of the head of the gendarme in Aintab, directly implicated in the Armenian genocide. So again, it reflects the history of the Armenians in the region. Now, why were they still there after most of the Armenian population of Aintab were deported in summer 1915? Well, two reasons. First, 
uh, as you may know, uh, Armenian Protestants, there were a certain time when they were exempted from deportation. This was a short period of time, so that was an important element to this. In fact, some of the records that I have seen, not related to the notebooks, but other sources that I use in my work, indicate that when the first deportation orders arrived to deport the Armenian Orthodox Gregorian community, uh, the local authorities told these two midwives to go around and notify the Protestant Armenians that they are not going to be deported. So because they were Protestant, they, 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 were, they knew everybody in the community, they knew pretty much everybody in Aintar, right? They were selected as the people who would go knock on doors and inform certain members of the community that they are exempted from deportation. So that's one. Then, however, of course, this is not, this is a temporary measure. Later on, everybody gets deported, right? They still are not deported. Why? Yes. They need them. The, you know, generally, this is an important, you know, you, do, you see this in the Armenian genocide uh, quite often. In certain towns and villages, sometimes certain Armenians are not deported, in fact are protected, and their entire family is kept in the region because they fulfill a function that others cannot or not in the quality that others can. Sometimes. So for example, uh, I'll give you an, uh, a very extreme case, very extreme case. So of course, one significant way would be when, it, when you have like an important engineer or doctor, etc. right? That's one extreme. There's also other, other ways. I have a friend whose great-grandfather from the Kharpert area survived the genocide, was not deported. Why? Because he had a medical condition that did not, he couldn't smell. He didn't have a sense of smell. And he worked in the sewage gutter system in the region. Uh, and so, so again, I give, I'm giving this extreme example to make a point, and the point being that you didn't really have to be a doctor or a midwife uh, to uh, sometimes avoid this. You know, filling a, a certain function that's important for the community plays a key role here. Of course, this is not to say that doctors and midwives at were not massacred. In fact, if anything, right, uh, the genocide swept entire regions and often people only later realize the kind of damage they have caused through this process of getting rid of their uh, Armenian population. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. In 1916, the, the governors, the, lo the leadership, the local leadership authorities of I uh, Urfa write to Jamal Pasha, the, the, who was uh, the leader of the region, and tell him that they need a few thousand Armenian artisans and workers back in their city. This is a year after the Armenians in Urfa were deported, most of them massacred, some who actually barricaded themselves and defended themselves, brutally killed on the spot as the Ottoman uh, military essentially defeated them eventually, right? Less than one year later, they are, they're asking one of the leaders of the Young Turk uh, Triumvirate to send some Armenians back to them. And that actually happens. In 1916, several hundred Armenians who were engineers, builders, workers, experts in different fields, and their families from Raqqa in Syria, Raqqa is now notorious for being the capital of ISIS, were sent back to Urfa because the community just, th the city just needed them and couldn't do without. You have similar cases elsewhere as well. In fact, some historians point to the fact that the entire east, eastern province, what is referred to as the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, Western Armenia, most of those areas never really recovered from the devastation 
of the Armenian Genocide. Many of these places today are in much worse condition than they were 100 years ago when Armenians lived there. An example in this regard. So uh, last year, in the city of Diyarbakir, there was going to be a commemoration, uh, again, uh, uh, on the occasion of the centennial, there was going to be a piano concert by Rafi Bedrosian, a concert pianist uh, from Canada. This was going to be the first time that after the Armenian Genocide, a concert, a piano concert was being held at the Surp Gilagos Church, which is the largest Armenian church in the Middle East, which was recently renovated by Armenians and the local Kurdish uh, uh, mayor. So Rafi Bedrosian needed to find a piano. Now, before I get there, let me go back 100 years. <coughs> During the Armenian Genocide, that very same church, the Surp Gilagos Church, served as a spla place for storage of confiscated, stolen Armenian property. An Arab merchant passing through the city lists some of the things that he saw in those storage spaces. And he lists a number of pianos, okay? Now, 2015, Diyarbakir, Rafi Bedrosian, is going to give a piano concert. They cannot find a piano for him. Eventually, he decided to have a piano shipped from Istanbul. Ultimately though, one of the local, uh, very well connected women, uh, always women come to the rescue everywhere, uh, managed to find a piano and the concert was held. Again, I give this example to highlight the fact that some of these places never recovered. We do talk about the loss for the Armenian community, and of course it's tremendous, and it will never be compared to the loss, and obviously a lot of the benefit, you know, the Turkish state and many local elites benefited tremendously from all of this. But again, uh, there's also the some kind of, on the local level often, tremendous loss. So, um, I, after this tangent, uh, let me go back. So they were, they fulfilled a purpose. They were important and that's why they were not deported. But even this was temporary. So in 1922, so th again, let, let's continue on with the history of Aintab, right? After the Ottoman defeat during World War I and after the occupation uh, by the British of Aintab and, the, and that region, many Armenians go back. In fact, close to 10,000 Aintab Armenians go back and several thousand others from other regions go back. Uh, so you have more than 10, 15,000 Armenians in Aintab after 1918, in 1919, 1920. And then there's the British uh, withdrawal, there's the French, and then there's the war between the War of Independence between the Turks and the French and the Armenians on the other, other hand. During this entire period when Armenians go back and continue to, to live in Aintab for a couple of years, the midwives again are helping deliver children of these Armenians. Even here, you see how so many Armenians who are from other parts of the Ottoman Empire, whose homes and towns and everything has been destroyed, who ended up in Aintab, they're giving birth with the help of these two sisters. And then of course, starting in 1920, uh, 20, you know, most of these Armenians are forced to leave. With the withdrawing French forces, a lot of them leave, and then the few who remain there are forced to leave in 1922, late 1922. We have British records, other documents that indicate how essentially they were told, you should leave or else. So we have in the notebook a little note. Both sisters write about this, but they write about it differently. One says, our work in Aintab is over. We went to the station, to such and such station, and from there with a few orphans of the Armenian Genocide, we escaped to Aleppo. The other sister, again, around the same time, makes a, a different entry. She talks about how they had to leave, ended up in Aleppo, and then where, how they start to pick up doing, you know, helping with childbirth in the city. 
So essentially the, the story and the history of these two women you know, is closely connected and mirrors the history of the Armenian community in Aintel. But not only that, it is also intricately connected with the history of a metropolis that was devastated by the genocide in a process of ethnic cleansing that emptied a community of its primarily Christian uh, population. And then we move to Aleppo. As I said, in Aleppo, the process uh, is equally fascinating. The almost like a week after they arrived in Aleppo, these two sisters are helping in childbirth. Immediately. And again, you see case after case, they're helping Armenians, Arabs, locals, Muslims, Jews, you name it. Again, it's another metropolis, another population that's very diverse, but primarily they're uh, helping deliver, they're delivering children of survivors of the Armenian genocide from all over the Ottoman Empire. Now, I'd like to uh, zoom in a little so that you can have uh <coughs> a closer look at this. So look at these numbers. You see like here, 3,385, that is the number of birth. She started at one, and then she's continuing, right? Uh, and, and imagine, when this is when she started keeping the record. Because she makes a note that in fact she did not start delivering babies at, in 1890, she started in 1888. So there's two years, that's not really uh, listed. We're talking here about 1918, right? And then you see one after the other, uh, Bitlis Muhajiri, Marashler from Marash, back to back the cases. Sometimes she mentions she lists what they do. You see Mormons again. Uh, and then here, Orlankas, Orlankas, whether it's like women or, or, or a boy or a girl. And then how much they charge them. And look at these. This is a varying price list, right? <laughs> you really don't know what you're going to get. So, so here's, uh, let me show you a couple of others that really highlight how these are also repositories of history and memory. So this is when they escape to Aleppo. Burdan, Bundan sonra korku sebebiyle, because of fear, after this, hastahaneye gelip Halebe geldik. We went to the hospital and then we went to Aleppo. 1923, December, uh, we entered Aleppo, right? And then, same, the, same month, right? The 4,275th child is born in Aleppo. And it's a Jew, Yahudi Jabra, uh, and then uh, you have the figure, right? This is just one sister, right? The other sister is also keeping a notebook. Now, let me move on. This is the last listing of Sephora before she retires. And then, so she retires at 4,978. And then here there's a note that says, uh, Sephora's uh, last child that was born, Serpui uh, Aparamians, and then how much she paid. It's, it's a girl, of course. Uh, that's her last hurrah. And she passes away shortly thereafter. This is a note at the end of the notebook that says, uh, May 28, 1940, at 4 p.m., Sephora Shinorokian died. And then there's some additional information on the family. Yes. So I'll talk a little bit about their journey, but uh, she sh that's where she passes away. Now, another tidbit, which is important. These are some examples of the statistics and the material you have in, in their notebooks. Detailed records of, you know, child mortality, uh, you know, how much they charge, where, when, and then also uh, detailed accountings and uh, bookkeeping of their own accounts, etc. And then this is where Nuritsa's, her sister's notebook starts. 
March uh, 1st, 1905, in Eintab. I will not go through this. There's like another lecture there, eventually one day. But what I want to do at this point is before I conclude and open it up for questions, is go over a couple of other things. So, so here, the end, uh, and then there's a list of miscarriages, okay? And then bills and uh, you know, issues that have to do with reporting to the government. As you can imagine, if you're not you know, having a baby at the hospital, somebody has to report these things, right? So the midwives are playing a crucial role, not just in terms of the community they're serving, but also a crucial connection between the community they're serving and the authorities. Now, before I go get to that, I'd like to play, this is uh, just a couple of minutes of one of the interviews I have conducted with this, the, the neighbor, right, next door neighbor of one of the midwives in Aleppo and I will translate after, you know, in uh, each portion, one after the other. But first, I'd like her to stand up and so that we acknowledge her. Can you please stand up? Huh. This is such a moving, this is such a moving account of their lives. And I will b say a few words after that again about this particular experience. And I will translate, uh, you know, every 10, 15 seconds. Oh, Hermine, say again. Nuritsan, or Earth Nuritsan, yev ir kuire digin of Sanan, but it's trati in mezi. Ir kuire halebi mech, harat bulgur. Harat bulgur. Burgol. Burgol. Harat burgol. So, by the way, this is right after my China lecture. Everybody was having cookies, I was interviewing her. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, this portion, this is where uh, she says that she was uh, the next door neighbor of, uh, of two of the sisters. I said there were three sisters. The, the, the older, the oldest sister had, you know, was, was not there at that point. Uh, and so, uh, so she lived right next door uh, to them. Yeah. In Aleppo, in a neighborhood called Burgol. So on, on her door, it was her name was written Nuritsa Shnorokyan. This is the younger sister. And then a uh, midwife nurse in Armenian on her door. Askina Amport Tarin Amport Tarin Hamar Nurser. Tea Polonska Vartangir Aseren, quite the Urish Chigar. So she's saying that this woman was a nurse for the entire neighborhood. And although many of us feared her the needles, but she was the only one available. So, in Mama Saina, then Chersor was a seren. As he got a sea, Udish Batmach. So, make Shatlam Shatlav Tratsun tune uneing. Kidekan and then Tratsiner Herasanel of Chainkar. Yep, to not Chainkarber. To check your cover of Turgo Kotzer, Kukar Tarima match or Hin Halebin. Hin Halevin Tarene, Panetsaze, Tarbas Panetsaze, Yev Yev Ampasse, Chelem, yet a madness, but yet to Celest Nujampo. So as or Nuritan Ampostarin Nurse Lale Patsi, Islam Christonia, Vorebe, Hai Arab Vorebe, Pan Akat Nerun. So she's talking about how uh, Nuritza uh, was, you know, that entire neighborhood. So this, Harad uh, Burgul was one where it's like there was one entrance with a gate, and then you walk in, you can't get out from anywhere else. You have to come back out from the same, uh, same end. And then there were a number of neighbors there. And an Armenian school. So door, one door next to the other, right? Some were Muslim, some were Christian, some were Armenian. And she served as the nurse for this entire neighborhood and beyond, right? 
And she's saying that apart from, from being a nurse, she was the Mother Teresa of the poor in that area. So she's saying that she was the Mother Teresa of that entire neighborhood for the poor. Uh, many of these people cannot, couldn't afford going to the hospital to deliver children. And uh, not only that, but she also visited them in the process during pregnancy and afterwards. And not only that, but she would, because she knew when, who was going to have uh, children, in fact, uh, and she also knew who, you know, th these children, at what age they are at any given point, she would go and visit these families again and tell them, by the way, your kids are grown now, can I get their clothes, their, their baby clothing? And then she would take them to other families who are needy, who are in need and would provide those to them. And, and then she says, you know, I have never seen these women make money. So I don't even, I can't even imagine how they, how they left. But this was, these are two, uh, you know, these sisters were extremely selfless. And as you can imagine, like dedicate their entire life to an episode of the Armenian nation. Again, we, we talk about, uh, you know, heroes on the battlefield. We talk about heroes, uh, but it's important to note that not all heroes on, are on horseback. Uh, not all heroes carry uh, weapons. And, and, and often uh, these uh, human beings who maybe never even imagined that 100 years later at a university in America there would be a lecture about them, <laughs> right? These, these, these two sisters uh, played such a key role in the life of a community at a time when the community was, you know, essentially oscillating between survival and destruction. So I'll stop here. The rest you have to read in some book or some article I write. So <laughs> nobody's allowed to talk to her. Uh, <coughs> so she talks about how you know they, they lived a very modest life, in, and then she she goes on and describes uh, not in the portion that I played, but. Uh, she goes on and describes their house, the entire neighborhood. In fact, I've prepared a map of every single household. So uh, again, they uh, continue to live in this neighborhood and continue to serve the Armenian community. Now, one of the things that I have done over the, fa the past uh, few months, uh, and again, this is like fresh research and it's more like a conversation with you here, uh, is, is try to again find the connections between uh, you know, th these individuals and uh, several el other elements, Ottoman census records, uh, other records and accounts of Armenians from Aintab who ended up in the United States, etc. In order to connect these narratives and connect, situate these notebooks in a broader context of Armenian history. Uh, you know, one of the major losses of the Armenian genocide, you know, we often talk about the loss of life. We often talk about the loss of wealth, land, property, even heritage, culture, buildings, churches, schools. But one of the major losses of the Armenian genocide are the, the broken family trees. Ask anyone who is 
not Armenian. Here in the United States, elsewhere, many parts of Europe. And all they need to do is go back to some kind of record and be able to trace their lineage all the way back to the 1700s. In the case of the Armenian Genocide, what it has done is baptism records, birth records, all the church records that existed. We're talking about more than 2,000 churches in the Ottoman Empire, Armenian churches before the genocide. All of them, almost all of them, have been completely destroyed. With this, we have lost millions of trees millions of family trees. And, and, and this is a, a, a tremendous loss because this is the loss that disconnects one branch of the tree from its other branches and one branch of the tree from the trunk and from the roots. And one of the important ways to try to remedy this in part is to try to bring together whatever records that we do have in order to recreate, you know, piece together some of these little segments. And then also in this exercise, try to understand how best we can do it today as scholars within the general restrictions that we have. Let me give you an example. The Ottomans kept detailed census records. We have, for example, census records for most villages in the Ottoman Empire from the 1840s, and then a few decades later as well. But then, after that, the records are not, have not been made public. So they're not accessible. So, uh, you know, census records and other, uh, you know, uh, figures from the late 19th century and the early 20th century are not available, are not open to the public in the Ottoman archives. You can imagine why, right? Because that's where, you know, uh, Pandora's box opens. That's where you can really demonstrate and show how many Armenians lived in these places, you know, the kind of impact they had in the community, you know, in, th in the region, their, their economic impact. You know, a lot of these senses were about taxation as well. So it's very important, right? But through notebooks, accounts, fam some salvaged family trees, it has been possible in recent years and and one uh, a friend of mine named George Arjan has done this uh, tremendous work in this regard. Ha it's been possible to connect many of these in certain villages, many of these families of survivors, to their relatives, their ancestors who are listed in the 1840 census. So there are many ways in which one can really piece together these stories, and I have done this uh, with this notebook and several other accounts prior to the genocide of certain families, and then after the genocide of several families who have arrived in the United States. And then again, the attempt here is to try to uh, sh demonstrate, at least give a few examples in this particular case, of how uh, fragmented, how cut and cut again these histories are, right? So you see a person showing up you know, in a list of people who are sentenced to death or sentenced to life imprisonment during the genocide, and then he shows up somehow in some deport deportee list, and then shows up somehow in a, you know, their, their children, his name shows up as, you know, his, his son being born in Aleppo. And then his name and his son's name shows up in a, in a, in a ship manifest arriving in the United States. And then his son's name shows up in, uh, in, in, in some kind of, uh, you know, census record or, uh, you know, uh, army uh, registration record, etc. right? Uh, so ultimately, these different pieces of Armenian history, these different pieces of Armenian experience, as the Armenians are being pushed and pulled from one place to the other in the late 19th and early 20th century, really allows us to think about the Armenian experience in a way that is different and realize, on the one hand, the extent of the loss, and on the other, the resilience and the dedication of these individuals who survived and thrived 
But at the same time, they were able to salvage uh, parts of their own history and narrative, right? By th whether through writing their own accounts, whether through writing uh, books, Hushamadians about their the town, their ho their hometowns, whether through preparing family trees, that really helped us. You know, decades later, more than a century later. In fact, I was looking at some uh, Ottoman census records the other day, and we were able to trace one family all the b way back into the late 1700s. And I was thinking, these people have done tremendous work by you know, documenting these little experiences in their lives, often without realizing that. 200 years later, some scholar somewhere is going to actually give a damn about what they wrote. Because ultimately, these are not just individual histories. These are not just the histories of one person or one family. Your history, your family history, your family tree is part of a bigger garden. And the moment you realize that uh, is the moment when you realize the connection of that everybody here has with one another. And the importance that you give to things like family history, and regardless of whether you are Armenian or not, by the way, uh, to family history and, 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 and these, these connections. In many ways, uh, Sephora and Nuritsa Shunorotian, uh, these two sisters who prepared these notebooks, they did this out of a love for record keeping. They did this out of uh, realizing the importance of bookkeeping and keeping a record of, you know, of, of, of the income they have. But somewhere along the line, and they did this with, as, as you saw in one testimony, and I came across again and again, interview after interview of the older family members of the Shinorokians. They did this out of complete dedication to their communities. Let me give you one final example and conclude. Uh, in her interview, she mentions seeing a very interesting doormat at the entrance of the sister's home. And then she says that she asked her mom about it, and her mom told her that the doormat is weaved off the hairs of the sisters. So every time they combed their hair, and there was hair that came out, they actually used that to weave an intricate and absolutely beautiful doormat. There's something powerful about weaving a doormat of the hair that comes off your head and putting it at the entrance of your door. If that does not say service, if that does not say community, I don't know what does. And I, this story was unbelievable to me. So I was, I was interviewing one of the other family members, and then the other family, you know, and she told me, oh, yes, by the way, there's something else. They had this doormat. <laughs> so it's like been passed out. And I said, okay, so what happened to this doormat? So yesterday, some of my, the phone calls I did were about the doormat. Uh, and it turns out that one of the grandchildren actually threw it away. Uh, now again, there's a story here because ultimately, you know, uh, one of the one of the, the sad experiences of, of, uh, for us historians, but for uh, for anyone who's interested in, in family history, is that most of the time, people uh, throw things away, right? Otherwise, you're going to be called a hoarder. So, right? <laughs> but but ultimately, uh, you know, I wanted to to conclude with the story of a doormat because it really made me think of that moment. When I was uh, uh, in Eintab, standing in front of the picture, the picture of these uh, sisters, and, and looking at several hundred strangers, mostly Turks, mostly uh, descendants, by the way, this is not in Eintab, as you can imagine. It's, it's at Franklin and Marshall in Pennsylvania. But uh, standing in front of several hundred Turks 
who, whose, dis whose ancestors were very much part of the life of these two women. And these two women were violently, alongside tens of thousands of other Armenians in that city, were violently taken away from their homeland. And in many ways, that doormat made from the hair of those two mid those midwives, the midwife, one midwife and her sister, made me think about how much of their soul, how many hours of their lives and of their dedication they spent, right? Uh, as they served the community initially in Aintab and then later on in Aleppo and elsewhere in, in Beirut, uh, you know, helping deliver thousands upon thousands of survivors of the Armenian genocide. And I also thought about, wondered, about how many of those hairs had grown white, hoping one day to be able to go back home. Thank you very much. So if we, if we have time, Thank you, Hachik. We, we definitely have um, some time for a few questions, uh, but before we open it up, I just want to thank you uh, for a wonderful lecture this evening and for a wonderful set of uh, lectures uh, over the course of the semester. Um, I think uh, the, the packed audience really uh, is proof of how much you've uh, engaged uh, with the community here as well as with the students, um, and I'm sure your students enjoyed thoroughly the course. Um, uh, that uh, you gave to them as well. So I'd just like to give one uh, round of applause <laughs> for Dr. Muradian for all you've done to contribute. Um, it's been a real pleasure um, to have you here and you've enriched us greatly. We'd now like to open the uh, floor to uh, questions. Uh, the sisters did not marry. The two midwives never married. Thank you for the question. Uh, so, uh, I'm so self-centered, you can't imagine. <laughs> uh, let's see how we're going to do this. Anyway, uh, so uh, one of the sisters here. Uh, so uh, these are the two sisters. That's a third sister who lived in Aleppo with the, uh, the younger, uh, younger midwife. Uh, that's the younger, that's the older, who passed away in 1930. And these are the two sisters who lived in Aleppo. Uh, the sisters, the midwives never married. They're the third sister, uh, so, uh, b however, as I said, there were six uh, sisters and brothers. And ultimately, the second generation was like 40, 40 members of the, uh, you know, different brands. So this is like a very extended, uh, huge uh, family. But yes, no, they never married. I do have some information about that as well, like their personal life, etc. But I don't. At this point, I want to piece some of the put together some of the pieces of the puzzle before I talk about that, particularly about the sister of Sanna and her own problems. And by the way, uh, one of the things that has come across very much, both in the notebooks and then in the interviews, is the fact that after the genocide. Uh, these women, despite the fact that, you know, they, they're serving the, the community and that's like completely selfless, but not only that, but they made every effort to not spend money and they were like very much, uh, you know, careful about, about that. This, the, the loss, uh, the tremendous loss that they experienced had a profound impact, including An Ofsanna, who also had uh, many problems, mental health problems. Uh, and again, I'm not going into a lot of the material uh, for a couple of reasons, including that I really want to piece, put everything together, and at the same time, I want to do it in a way that honors and respects, uh, you know, the family. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, 
that they, they had. I mean, they knew Armenian. They knew how to write in Armenian. The, uh, so, but uh, in Turkey, they spoke to about, yeah. uh, It's Turkish. It's wholly Turkish. But the letters are Armenian letters. Yeah. But very clean. Very, yes. 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 Sometimes whenever there's a, there's a payment that's made, let me say also that in some of these cases, these notebooks have stayed in the family for a century, right? And every now and then somebody from Aintab would show up at the, at the house and they would say, oh, my grandfather or father or whatever, can we check, right? So there's a lot of notes and stuff like that on the pages sometimes, so I don't know what you're referring to. So there are some check marks on the payments, but at the same time there are other uh, check marks and notes that have to do with people checking things. Uh, I can give you countless examples of uh, very successful Armenian Americans today, including, for example, uh, the head of Near East Foundation, uh, for example, uh, who are grandchildren, great-grandchildren of uh, children, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, people that were delivered by uh, the, the two midwives. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, one of the things that I have done is, and again, this is a work in progress, very much so. Like this is the very first time I'm talking about this. I haven't talked about this to myself either. Like I'm really. Uh, so that one of the things I've been trying to glean from all of this is how they approach these families and how they approached, uh, you know, delivering children in general. One of the aspects that's important to note, though, is that these two sisters were extremely religious and extremely pious. If there's one thing that really defines them, apart from their profession, it's that. And you see this time and time again in this entire uh, process. Now. Uh, what I have done right now, currently I'm in the process of, uh, bottom line, I'm, I'm trying to get some uh, institutional funding to be able to uh, have this whole thing typed and then uh, prepare, uh, you know, you can, the things you can do with this, right? Once you have everything typed, the, st the st statistical information, you know, all kinds of things, right? Is, is tremendous. So that is going to be the next phase. At that point, I will have a little better idea whether also we'll be able to compare to child mortality, mortality rates in general and things like that. But specifically as far as the uh, children who were uh, uh, stillborn children are concerned, I, I did look, and remember, I have not read line by line every single page. We're talking about, uh, you know, 10,000 children. Uh, and you know, it's been the last three months. Uh, you know, I've been, I've, I've done a couple of other things as well, apart from reading this. <laughs> so, but it is one of the things I'm watching. Not perhaps particularly that, but uh, cert how they approached uh, being a midwife in general. So, for example, uh, there are a lot of challenges to this, right? Uh, issues of guilt and responsibility. Uh, issues of, uh, you know reporting to authorities, issues of connection to people you know and do you don't know, issues of how much you charge and how much you don't charge. Uh, and at the same time, there's a the context of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, midwives were uh, also often were the pharmacists, were also often the doctors, right? And how much of that played into this, right? Uh, their interaction, so f let me give you an example wha why I'm saying this. Uh, when you read accounts of important or famous people in Aintab, 
You see pages and pages of doctors from Ain Tab, but not their names because they didn't have a degree. These are really, like I was saying, the, la you know, like the, the people's midwives. These were the people's midwives, the, the, uh, generally in the Ottoman Empire and elsewhere as well, as you can imagine. This was something that was passed down from one generation to the other, mostly from mother to daughter, but also you know, to close relatives as well. And this is how they, they picked up the, the, the craft. And then it's, it's been passed down like that. And so it's, it's my next challenge is to really uh, look uh, deeper and deeper into this and to try to glean things. Just to give you an example, this whole thing about childbirth and, and you know, the, the buttocks first and the head first, etc. I didn't know this stuff. I, I mean, so, like, so I, one of the things that I did was, you know, read about, you know, how this works. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think the stork brought the kids, <laughs> but still, right? Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, so there's, there's a few things in this. One is the challenges of midwifery and how that applies to this, the, the period about in which we're talking about, about which we're talking about, the Ottoman context. And the fact that these two Armenian women are very much, uh, you know, you don't have that many, that, uh, that many examples of midwives in the 19th century, in, in, you know, in, 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 this, in these regions who are like this prolific, for lack of another word. And it's a phenomenal resource, again, in general for Ottoman history. Because it is also part of the history of Aintab and part of the history of the Middle East. In, uh, in uh, you know, ultimately my, uh, and sorry for taking this on a tangent and saying a few other things as well. Uh, ultimately my, uh, what I would like to do is, you know, tell their story from that perspective. Because again, there's a lot from the history of the Middle East that you can glean, right? Jews and Mormons and Arabs and Muslims and Kurds and Turks and you name it, right? through this like uh, study of, uh, of the experience of these two midwives. So again, honestly, I'm unable to uh, respond to your question because there's a lot that I'm learning in this process. Yes, I'll come back to you. Thank you, thank you. I have to say though, some of the furniture in my apartment is, uh, was given to me by members of this community, so. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, there was a question over there. Yes, yes, yes. There were, so there are accounts in fact of some Mormons who went there and they've written like dozens of pages about their experiences in the Ottoman Empire uh, as well here from the United States. Uh, so yes, there were means. Yes. Yes. Okay, so let me, since there's a question about the rest of the family, let me tell you a quick question about one brother who was a fascinating person. So they had, uh, so we're talking about Three brothers, right? Uh, one brother was a famous, well-known reverend, Badveli. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he, 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 uh, he, he became a Badveli later in life. He left everything, became a Badveli, and was very well respected. Uh, another one was uh, uh, Hovannes, again, uh, Badveli Hago Hovannes. However, the, the interesting aspect here is the third brother, whose name is Mihran. Uh, so is Mihran the first name? 
Manasseh. Oh, okay. Manasseh is not this generation. It's the next gen. Yes. So. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So let me say something about Mihran. Fascinating. This guy was apparently hilarious, right? He told jokes left and right, and everybody loved it. In fact, at his brother's funeral, people were gathered, and he kept telling stories about his brother, like these funny stories. And you know, people who were at the funeral just constantly remember that experience. But one of the fascinating things he did was, in Lebanon, he would pick up uh, the newspaper Astak, the Armenian language newspaper, flip it over, and then read it in reverse. <laughs> Not only that, but he would pick up the Astak, flip it over, read in reverse in Turkish. <laughs> so again, not just one or two people, everybody kept talking about Mihran as this like, you know, prodigy. So just a side note about, uh, about that, that brother. And it, yes? Uh, uh, ma ta there's tayak, well, the manga parts, tayak, there's several words for it. The Turkish word is ebe, Armenian is manga parts, tayak, and uh, in Aintab, a lot of Armenians from Aintab actually referred to them as, as Sephora. Whether you were Sephora, Jacqueline, Var Vartuhi, Var whatever, if you were a midwife, you were Sephora. Yes. Yeah, so join the club. <laughs> uh, any, uh, most people who, whose, whose family members are born in Aintab in this period that I'm talking about, it's, there's, a, there's a good chance they would be listed here. And most people whose family members were born in, in Aleppo between World War II, between 1922, 23 and World War II, again, there was a, there's a decent chance for their names to be listed there. I see. I see. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> if you have questions, you can feel free to approach me outside. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you very much uh, again. And yes, we encourage you all to continue. Thank you all for a wonderful semester. And we look forward to seeing you next semester for a continuation of the lecture series and at the banquet on March 19th. Good night.